Father. Um, well, last session, last session, I've been, I, often, I often end up talking at the very last session of conferences. And here's my insight into the last session of conferences. The last session of conferences, it's tempting to think it's like the first row of the seating in your building. Um, do you know why you put out the first row of chairs in a building? To make sure people sit in the second row. Yeah, that's right. Because you, no one in our... Well, this is very good, but most people only ever sit in the second row. So if you took the first row out because no one sat there, they'd all sit in the row behind, and you know what I'm saying. The reason you have the last... Well, here it is in despair mode, right? The reason you have the last session of a conference is... To make sure at least they stay for the second last session of the conference, all right? So we're tempted to put on an after-lunch session just to make sure everyone gets through to that time at least. But anyway, here we are. Let's not let it be that. This is, a, this is a wonderful time to actually finish up in the Word of God. It's been a great feast as we've kind of dug into Titus and wrestled with all kinds of issues together and so on. It is wonderful to be together with you all. Um, and I want to finish by doing something kind of complex. I want to think with you about how to leave this place. And it's kind of complex about how to leave. Uh, how, how do you go from this place back into our ministries? What heart, what attitude do you have? Do, do you leave this place with hope and confidence and, and kind of bounce out with great security and joy and get back into the ministries full of hope and, and uh, this beautiful enthusiasm and thrill of doing God's work? Is that how we're meant to go out from this place enthused and energised and empowered? Who's feeling energised and empowered? But is that how we're meant to go out from this place? Or are we meant to go out from this place wary, concerned, concerned about the dangers, wary of the possibilities I might fail, it might fail, and careful about my frailties. We start at the conference with the warnings of pastors who fell away, and how are we going to finish? How do we leave with that kind of wariness? Which do you go out with? Well, here's the complex thing. It's kind of really weird, and it feels kind of confused, but it's hard to avoid if you're a Bible reader. We need to leave with both. That's exactly right. We need to live with both. Um, and I want to give us both from a passage that does both, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Come over there and I'm going to pray for us as we start, but flip over to 1 Corinthians 10 so that we can um, look together at this text before we go. And just a quick promise, I'm going to sing a song later, so we'll see how that goes as well. Just a special treat for you who managed to stay all the way to the end, but let me uh, pray for us. Or not, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the great time it's been to be together and ask please that you might bless this final time around your word together and uh, you might use it for our good and your glory and strengthen us as we leave this place we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Well it, it is uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 I want to look at with you. It's a, it's a complex kind of part of the Bible but it does, well I'm, I'm going to go to the end of it actually because the finish of it gives you great heart and great comfort and great confidence. Come with me to chapter 10 verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear but when you are tempted he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Um, it is a passage with uh, grave warnings. We'll come to those in a moment but it finishes this little section uh, as the letter starts actually. I'll come back to the beginning of the letter with you but it finishes this little section with this uh, expression of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians to us that uh, God is that God who is with you. God is the great sovereign God who, who, who is for his people. Uh, he is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Uh, he, but when you are tempted, he will give you a way out so you can endure, not a way, not, not take it all away, but actually uphold you and strengthen you in the midst of it. Uh, come back to chapter 1, you see the kind of same idea wonderfully expressed back there. Chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful. Verse 8, he, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless, so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord. God is faithful, who has called you into his fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This beautiful expression of the faithfulness of God, who is at work in his people, that you can turn to and have confidence in. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in the midst of temptations and struggles and difficulties and despair, he's with you in that, he'll uphold you through that. You can turn to him and find confidence and strength. Uh, they're beautiful words of assurance. God is with his people. He has an eye over us. Um, 
the sovereign, as we struggle through life and tempted and challenged and confronted, he provides, he cares, he is for you, he will uphold you. Now, many of you will go back to challenging situations. Well, which of us is not going back to a challenging situation? Uh, we all go back to challenging situations. Don't imagine um, that bigger churches don't have challenges. Don't imagine in a bigger church that smaller churches have got it. We've all got our different contexts that are all very challenging. Uh, it is a difficult ministry. And know that in the midst of wherever you go, uh, God is with you. God is with you. He is your ever-present help in trouble. In the midst of whatever troubles come, cry out to him. Uh, recent time, Simon Manchester shared uh, wonderfully what he said was the preacher's prayer. And I found myself listening to it going, that's exactly what I pray all the time. And here's the, pre here's the preacher's prayer. Have you heard this one? Here's how it goes. It goes like this. Dear Father, help. 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 Amen. Isn't that the preacher's prayer? Don't you just, you just find yourself kind of trying to work out how to preach, what to say, and you, you, you roam the, the house just going, Lord, I don't even know what to ask for. Help. Help. And as you walk up into the pulpit, you're going, to go, I, haven't, I haven't got anything. I don't know what to say. Help. Well, the Lord answers those prayers. Uh, it's a beautiful prayer. I think it throws you on God and his mercy. The Spirit cries out with you uh, with, with words that cannot be expressed. Um, Know that about God, isn't it? This is wonderful. We are not on our own. He is with us. Um, but we, we go with this hope in the context of a warning. You do need to pay attention to yourself as you leave. You need to pay attention to yourself in all the challenges that you fight, that you keep running, that you keep persevering that you live by faith, trusting in God and his future hope, and not allow yourself to be undone by the challenges. The Christian needs to live with two instincts, and particularly the pastor, that you look to God for your deliverance and, and comfort and strength, you're enabling, you trust him, confident that he has you. And you work at your perseverance. You fight. And you fight and run in what feels like your strength. Don't get caught up in that kind of separation of if, if it feels hard, it can't be God at work, it must be me only. Now the Lord Jesus cried out in the garden with great pain as someone who was in the Lord's strength that often feels like it's hard, but we need to fight with what feels like our efforts, knowing by faith that it's God who's at work in us, to will and to act, Philippians chapter 2. And so you get in chapter 9, the introduction to chapter 10, really, uh, as you go through. Look at verse 24, chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run, therefore, in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that won't last. But we get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, and he starts mixing metaphors here, of course, don't try and pin it all down, to make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I might not be disqualified for the prize. The Apostle Paul talks about the fact that we're in a race. This is something that needs to bring self-discipline and exercise and control. You need to work at it, and it's a race with a goal. We're not just running on a treadmill in the lounge room. We're in a race towards a great goal, and that is massively important to, the Paul, to Paul's thinking. Um, the runner enters a race to, to win a prize. He doesn't just, doesn't just run aimlessly. There is a goal at the end. Uh, early, he talks about, uh, in chapter 8, for the Corinthians actually entering the kingdom. They need, to, they need to make every effort to enter the kingdom. Don't you know that the immoral won't ever enter the kingdom? It matters that we get to this goal. Here, he talks about a crown that will last, verse 25, a crown that will last forever. We run for an eternal outcome, a crown that will last forever, a, a crown of glory. Christian lives need to be lived aware that we're on a journey towards a prize. We need to consciously buck cultural thinking. And what, I, what I mean by this is, how many times have you heard that little saying, uh, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey? Isn't that, 
you, you only come to that thinking if you're not a Christian who has no hope beyond the end of life. Isn't that right? If, if all you have is this world, then the journey is all you've got because there is no destination. And so smell the roses as much as you can because that's all you've got. But that ought never be us. We must consciously push against that kind of thinking. Um, we, uh, we are in it for the destination. Um, we, we've got to play down that kind of cultural thinking. Um, brothers and sisters, we do have a hope. We have a glorious hope that will make this present experience pale by comparison. The point of Paul's language is, is along this kind of line where it's the victor's crown, it's the crown of glory that's awaiting us. It's infinitely more glorious and more wonderful than what we have here and now. We're in the wilderness on the way towards the promised land. And that goal stands before us. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, for the joy set before him endured the cross. He went through that distress to get to the great goal. And have you reflected, the goal must be so wonderful for the Son of God that he would endure such a thing to get there? Paul the Apostle doesn't run aimlessly, he runs to receive a reward. In a very few short years, some of you much sooner than others, in a very few short years it will all be gone, this life. It will be stripped bare and it will just be what you have in Christ left. None of your other attainments, none of your other successes. It will just be you and the Lord Jesus that you're in him that you have run for him, that you have um, sought to gather as many as possible to be with him, that's all that will be left. Run that race towards that end, whatever the cost. And being conscious that the destination actually does empower the journey, it shapes the journey. Run and so exercise self-control, be focused on what matters, keep focused there and shape your life towards that goal, but that takes discipline, it takes constant effort. And run because God has given us a massive lesson in how you need to run. You need to run. You need to be disciplined. And that's the first five verses of chapter 10. You see how it starts with the word for? For I don't want you to be ignorant of this fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they were all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them as the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, verse 5, God was not pleased with all of them. Most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred. These things happened in history for us that we might be helped to pursue rightly the task that we have. This part of the Bible is hugely sobering, isn't it? They, here's a group of people who had a saving experience. They had God amongst them. Christ, in some sense, was with them, verse 4. And you get this repeated use of the word all through there. They were all baptised, they were all ate, they all drank, they all... Uh, and so on. But verse 5, the contrast is... Most of them never made it. Deeply sobering. Now what do we do with that series of events from the Old Testament? Well, it's there in verse 6 and verse 11. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. These things happened as examples. Now, just a little translation thing. You've got um, the word translated example in the NIV is the word tupos. Um, it's the word you get the language of typology from, type. Um, and it's probably, it's probably better translated, not example, but paradigm. Type itself is a hard bit of language to understand unless you've done lots of theology and so on. But it's it, a way to perhaps translate a formative paradigm a formative pattern and what Paul says in verse 6 is these things happened as 
a paradigm, a formative paradigm to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. These things, verse 11, happen as a formative paradigm and were written down as warnings for us on whom the combination of the ages come. A paradigm. It's a paradigm. They, that was a paradigm of the Christian life. A paradigm of the journey from being from experiencing a saving act to being on a journey to final salvation, if you like, being saved to be finally saved. That was a paradigm, a type of our experience. It, it, it's a type, a paradigm. It isn't the same thing. That's the key. This isn't an example of the Christian life. It's a paradigm of the Christian life. That's different. It's, a, it's not... It's not um, Christianity lived then. It's not the same in every particular. Uh, just like the temple is a type and the kings are a type. They're the same in many particulars, but not every. So you don't learn from chapter 10, verse 1 to 5, whether or not Christians can fall away. You don't, you don't go from that type, that paradigm, and apply every particular and say, there's an example of people who were eternally saved but lost their salvation. How can that be? I thought God was to faithful, bring us to the end. You don't, you don't pick that up. It's a type, a paradigm. But what you do learn is this. If you don't combine the initial experience of the saving work of God in your life, if you don't combine the many blessings of God in your life with... I'm going to say two things you are either not saved or you won't finish the journey now what are those two things well you've you've got three occasions where the example of israel is used by the new testament you get another one in hebrews chapter 4 come over there and i'll show you this Have a look at verse 2. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. Now he's referencing back to Israel. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they didn't share the faith of those who obeyed. They didn't add to that experience, if you like, faith. Faith in the God who brought them that experience. They didn't add faith. They didn't have faith. They experienced all of this, but they didn't combine it with a, an inner relationship with the God who performed that saving work. They didn't have faith. And you come back to 1 Corinthians 10, and I'd suggest what you have here is that the, 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 the Israelites had these experiences of saving the work of God saving through out of the Exodus, out, out of Egypt and so on. They didn't combine to it faith, Hebrews chapter 4, but neither did they combine with those experiences perseverance. The discipline of perseverance. And what I would suggest is that the paradigm is given for us, God is concerned for us so much that he's given us this paradigm. And don't press all the details. But the point is, I think what God is teaching through this is that it doesn't matter just that you've had extraordinary experiences of God in your life. Experiencing spectacular things. You know, the blessing of growing up in a Christian home. A spectacular thing. The, the, the blessing of tongues or prophecy or some kind of miraculous thing that's happened. The blessing of um, feeling great deep feelings. The blessing of these things. It's not sufficient to simply have those experiences. None of that secures a person's salvation unless you combine those things with faith and perseverance. Now, the Apostle Paul is talking into a particular setting, particularly a setting where the Corinthians were presumptuous. And so there's where Paul 
says he, he says verse 12 if you think you're standing firm be careful that you don't fall he's talking to a group of believers who had presumed on their faith presumed on the saving experiences of God particularly really the spectacular things they've had and presumed therefore that of all people they're fine of all people they'll be okay they can test God chapter 10 verse 14 with the idolatry they can test God with playing with fire and it'll all be okay they presume so that's their particular setting. And the danger, of course, is applying it to us, which how many of us are like the Corinthians here today? I don't see much Corinthianism amongst us. But I would offer these thoughts. There is a difference between the confidence that comes from true faith and presumption the presumptions the Corinthians had the presumption that we can fall into let me give you the difference that I think it is you you can have faith in the grace of God or you can have faith in faith you can have faith in the goodness and mercy of God towards you in Christ or you can have faith in your own self-worth that means you are worthy surely of this experience and gifting faith in grace makes a person humble and grateful it's a faith that's directed towards God and his mercy is captured by God and centered on him finds their confidence not in themselves but in him and his 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 ability to hold me that's confidence in true faith I'm saved because of his kindness and it cultivates a confidence that's not presumption but presumption is the assumption that of course I'll be fine I've done this I've been there I'm this kind of person I have this experience surely I'll be okay someone with my history and so on must surely be okay so I can I can play a little bit more loose and stretch the boundaries. God, of course, will keep me. It's me, after all. Why wouldn't he? Presumption. And you notice the difference in the direction of the person's confidence. One is in God and his grace, and the other one is in faith and their experiences and what's happening for them in themselves and their history. Let me just apply this to us. Each of you, each of us, must come to a place of personally placing your trust in God. You, you must come to a place of personally putting your confidence in him owning honestly your lack of merit perhaps even feeling the weight of loss that we are owed if it's just left to us coming to that point of feeling the weight of that i have no hope apart from god and his grace it's very hard to have true faith i think without a sense of personal grief over your own lostness is it Don Carson? I, I can't remember exactly the details, but I think Don Carson shares a story of, a, um, of two women in, in a church he was preaching at or pastoring. And he talks about one uh, woman who came out of the church service full of excitement about the experience of church and how amazing the singing was and how moving the sermon was and how beautiful the feelings were that were aroused within her. And she was blub bubbling with the thrill of it all. And she seemed so excited and captured and so on. And he said he found another one, if I remember rightly, sitting completely still in the chair at the end of the service, bent over, just sitting. And he came alongside and asked if she was okay. And she said, I'm just in awe of God's goodness. I'm in awe of his greatness. Now, both were moved. But you see the difference in what moved them. One was moved by the experience of having awe in God. The other one was moved by God and his glory and greatness. Do you see the difference? Quite profound. It's the difference between the bride who's excited to become a bride and the bride who's excited to marry that man. It's a profound difference. It matters that you combine all that you've experienced in your life under God 
with a confidence in him and not in your experiences. That you turn to him in grace and find his grace. Then you have the key to assurance, which is in him, not you. It's in the one who has promised who is faithful. He is faithful and my confidence is in his faithfulness, not in my being faithful. Profoundly different but deeply important. And the history of Israel pushes you here. They didn't combine all those saving experiences with faith in the God who brought them through those things. But I think 1 Corinthians 10 also pushes you to combine your faith with perseverance. The discipline to keep the goal in mind to the end, to run the race, constantly alert to dangers, constantly alert to the need to say no. Paul gives uh, five examples there in 6 to 10 um, about uh, things they fell over. Uh, They were idolaters, they were uh, sexually immoral, they grumbled and tested and so on and... Uh, actually, it's probably four things, with the, the first one in verse 6 is the overarching one. Look, therefore, at verse 6 for the sake of time. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Or better, setting our desires. I think, did you read from the ESV there? Setting our desires on... Uh, whoever read? Did, did you? Yeah. It, setting our desires on evil things is... is it's epithumia. It's the... It's the it's the... It's the word about desire over desire they set their desires on evil things and so they were ripe for the fall they were ripe for sexual immorality they were ripe for grumbling they were ripe for testing God because their heart was divided their heart had been set towards other things they hungered for that which which would destroy and they despaired at their circumstances and their goal because God because they couldn't see their goal clearly the heart and the desires were wrong now brothers and sisters it should be obvious to us that we won't be un- very few of us will be undone by the one great moment very few of us will be undone by the one big thing that happens we'll die a death of a thousand cuts that's what will happen to us. We'll die a death of a thousand cuts when our heart is unguarded. When our heart becomes self-assured. Others may fall, I never will. Be careful. Or a heart that's divided. A heart that wants the world and wants the kingdom It's a heart that wants a foot in both camps, a heart that wants to keep its its grip on these things and not let go whilst I pursue God and his, a heart that's divided. You know that, it's like having, have you ever stepped between two boats, two rowboats, small boats? You, you, You put one foot into the kingdom and you've still got one foot in the world and that is a very awkward place to be. You have to decide whether to step back or forward. You can't live like that. But many believers do. Let me offer a cure. I think the cure, one of the cures, is to deal with desire. To fuel the right desire. To fuel Godward desires. Godward kingdom desires. And to drink deeply of two things. Here's where we're coming to a song. To drink deeply of two things, the truth and beauty. The truth of the gospel and the beauty of the gospel. The truth, the truth the scriptures bring us is that there's only one way to be saved, it's in Christ. Without Christ you are lost eternally. What good is it to gain the whole world yet forfeit your soul? That's the truth. Death outside of Christ. That's true. Keep clear on that. Don't let anything compromise that. Water that down. There is no other name by which we can be saved. There is a heaven and hell. There is, these things are true and real. Keep them clear. But there's beauty. When you see the truth of God and who he is and his love, that's a beautiful thing. The gospel is a beautiful thing. 
the kingdom that's coming is, is a treasure, is, is a pearl of great price, is a crown of glory. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Not just for the truth set before him, he endured it, you see. Truth and beauty. And when you keep the truth and beauty in mind, you're able to actually contrast it with the present world and what it's like, which is superficial and shallow. It only appeals because you actually don't see beneath the surface. You don't let yourself see beneath the surface. The kingdom and the life of faithful godliness is beautiful and it's good. And keeping that clear before us, God and his love, who will sweep you up in his arms and cry over you, is a beautiful thing. Don't ever lose the beauty of the truth of it, you see. And here's where I'm going to try and sing. I'm, um, I've, I've got two, two songwriters that I really love. The, most, the, the songwriter I love the most is, is um, Trevor Hodge. Just to, <laughs> just, to, just to put it out there, right? I, I think Trevor is a fantastic gift to us. The, but there's another songwriter I think is pretty good too. And it's a man called Josh Garrels. Has anyone heard of Josh Garrels? Yeah. Yeah, okay, there you go. I'm late to the party, all right? But uh, I find out Trevor loves this man too. And um, I, I've, been enjoying, uh, I've been enjoying a song. Now, I don't know if you realise I enjoy music, but there you are. I'm enjoying this song. And I'm going to sing it. Well, no, I'm actually going to speak it to you because we'll see what happens, all right? I might burst out and see. Well, but I'm going to see it up on the, st on the screen here. Let me take you through this. You ready for this? No, I can't. Well, I might. We'll see. This is, the, oh, this is incredibly clever lyrics. There's a place, a garden for the young, to laugh and dance in safety among the shimmering light in the shade of the trees. Isn't that beautiful? That's a picture of the garden. But not just a statement of the truth, but captured in poetry. In the shimmering trees. It's beautiful. But steal a bite and paradise is lost. With darkened hearts, we didn't count the cost. Forgot all that we'd left behind. Life picks up speed before you know. We hold on for dear life, O oh Lord. We're too proud to turn back now. This man, who uh, Josh Garrels, who wrote this song, uh, grew up in the home of a good man, he says, in another song, and became a drug dealer at school. He, he, he turned away and was allured by the world around him and thought he'd find beauty and greatness there but was destroyed by it. He's too proud to turn back now and he set his heart on evil desires. One day it all falls down. It breaks our heart and breaks our crown. It brings us down where we see. A beautiful hope. It's going to be all right. Turn around and let back in the light. Not just the truth but the light. And joy will come. And here's the worst line in the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> like a birdie in the morning sun. What is that? Um, but you get what he's trying to say, don't you? He's, he's, tr he's, trying to, he's trying to capture this beautiful image. And I, oh, it doesn't do it for me, but there you are. And all will be made well again. Once again. And I want, here's what I think he brings. He brings this picture of hope. This, this hope that is full of light and life that's beautiful. Let me go for the next one. There's a way that seems right to a man till he's in over his head and he don't understand. All the plans he made only led him astray. The foolishness of evil desire. The foolishness of evil desire that will destroy you. But every good gift comes down from above. From the Lord of light, like a labour of love. Every good gift comes from a God who loves us, who labours over every good gift for you. Upon the child who waits for him. Sometimes you find what you're waiting for was there all along just waiting for you to turn around and reconcile. It may be broken down, all the bridges burned like an old ghost town, but this, my son, can be made new. It's a beautiful gospel message. Hope and light and life. Brothers and sisters, we don't just have the truth. We have a beautiful truth. And the more you can actually embrace the truth and the beauty of it, your heart will be guarded. 
Learn the lesson of, lesson of Israel. Watch your desires. Watch your desires. Guard your heart. Guard your desires, especially because we do life with God in the wilderness. It's a paradigm for us that we've been saved for this present age to live through the wilderness before the promised land comes. And so in that context, it's easy to lose sight of our God, his truth, his beauty, his goodness, and not combine the experiences of his saving work in our life with faith in him, trust in him, and perseverance to say no to the temptations of the wilderness that we're in. And the temptations of the wilderness we're in are great, especially because the wilderness we wander through is very attractive. We need this more, more than even Israel to guard our hearts. But think through the attractions of this world. Think through the attractions of this world. They have no substance. Give up Christ for an adulterous affair. You will lose, everybody loses. To indulge in the life of the present, it will all be stripped away. Wisdom is proved right in a children. It's the path of choosing the wise choices, the discipline to say no to that which seems so attractive, to the adulteress that drips honey, but will destroy you. To say no, you'll see the wisdom of that choice in time. Not in the immediate, but in time. Grumbling is the heart of despair that says, there is no future. What's the future? How can I trust God in the midst of this? There are saints who have gone before us who have shown the path that it is worth it. Having aged leaders like Philip around is really helpful. Who has, who has walked the path for decades, who wears the scars, but has stood firm in the faithfulness of his God and shown the beauty and greatness of it. Isn't that right? There's a depth and richness there that's wonderful. And brothers and sisters, that's held out before you. Keep your heart set on that. Keep your heart set on that. As you leave us today to go back into the real world, you go back to the wilderness where it's dry, where it's hard because we're not home yet. Go back into that place, keep the goal in mind, guard the desires of your hearts, keep God our Saviour in mind and trust Him, He is faithful. Look to Him and His greatness and glory to guard you, trust in Him and determine to discipline yourself, to run and persevere in saying no to what you need to say no to and yes to what you need to say yes to, aware that the wisdom of that may not be seen yet, but it will be. Because of the beauty of the crown to come, the, the glory and greatness of the kingdom that we'll inherit is worth every cost, is worth every sacrifice. Persevere. How about I pray? Heavenly Father, we do ask, please, that you might help us guard our hearts that you might help us please uh, live by faith in you, look to you as our great guardian and saviour, not to ourselves, not to our experiences. Help us please continue to throw ourselves on you in prayer uh, and in the, the longings of our heart. We pray please you'd help us combine that faith with perseverance that we might persevere to, to run the race with discipline, to say no to what we need to say no to, yes to what we need to say yes to, and that we might do all of that with a clear mind that there is truth in this gospel and beauty in this gospel, and there is nothing that compares with it anywhere, that we might be kept safe, we ask, in, in your great, great hand, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.